Hi, I'm Bart Polson, and this is a video for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this video, we're going to look at Chapter 6 on Adolescence, Section 1, about physical development in adolescence. First thing we want to talk about is good old puberty. So, well, let's define the term. Adolescence is uh, interesting. It's, it's a historical thing, and it, it doesn't hasn't always existed as a discrete period. It used to be you went from straight from childhood to adulthood. But adolescence, uh, you know, is a relatively recent invention. It's a transitional period between childhood and adulthood. And it's seen as, you know, bounded by puberty at the lower end um, and the assumption of adult responsibilities at the upper end. So it's the difference between sort of the biological maturation and the uh, social, intellectual, or really social uh, maturation at the other end. Now, one of the big things here, of course, is uh, growth spurts. And what this chart shows you is how many inches uh, the average American girl or boy grows per year. And obviously, when they're really little, they grow a lot. And you see that it slows down to just about two inches. It sort of stabilizes from about four to nine years old. And then we get growth spurts. And the girls with the, uh, the red or orange line, they have a growth spurt first and you see that they go up and the boys actually seem to slow down uh, around the same period and their spurt comes a little bit later and then both of them seem to have settled down by the time they're 20 years old and they're pretty much at their adult height. So girls begin in general at around 10 years old um, uh, with puberty and that's just you know reaching sexual maturity and the ability to reproduce. Girls begin uh, puberty around 10, boys around age 12, although it, it varies a uh, substantial amount from one person to another. Now, by the end of the adolescent growth spurt, girls have grown approximately 13 inches, while boys have grown about 14 and a half. You know, these are averages. And uh, what's interesting, though, is that during these teenage years, some parts of the body grow at different rates. And so, for instance, you might have feet or hands uh, growing faster. And then this unequal growth pattern is called asynchronous growth. So it just means not synchronized. Also, better nutrition during the 20th century caused children in uh, industrialized countries to grow at a faster rate and become taller in adulthood than in previous generations. So, for instance, 15-year-old uh, boys now, as compared to 30 years ago, they're about 15-year-old boys are about six inches taller now than they were 30 years ago, and 15-year-old girls are about three inches taller than they were 30 years ago. Now, this tendency, which is called a secular trend, um, is, is now only you only see this change in cohorts in uh, developing countries these days. Okay, a little bit about puberty here. First off, we see that only um, the facial hair growth is not universal. Only half of American boys need to shave by the time they're 17. Um, an increase in testosterone and the production of testosterone by the excuse me by the pituitary gland. Uh, causes the male testes and the penis to enlarge during puberty and with time uh, pubic hair facial underarm hair also develops male voice begins to deepen around age 14 or 15 and that's actually due to the growth of the larynx um, also testosterone can lead to things like acne it can also lead to nocturnal emissions or wet dreams and at about age 20 or 21, puberty actually ceases for males due to what's called epiphyseal closure, and that prevents the long bones from growing any further. So that's the end of the growth spurt. Now, how about in girls? In females, the pituitary gland causes increased estrogen production in the ovaries at puberty. Um, also, breast enlargement starts around age 10, although it does vary from person to person and uh, it's followed by the widening of the pelvis, the growth of pubic and underarm hair, and the development of the female reproductive system. That brings in menarche, or the first menstruation, the first period. And girls begin their first menstruation, you know, around 11 to 14. But, you know, again, plus or minus two years. At some kids, it actually happens very early. Um, it can change. And the average menstrual cycle is about 28 days, but irregularity is common for the first few years after menstruation begins and then it stabilizes later on. Okay, how about brain development? Here we have a violinist. Um, brain development in teens is influenced by natural growth, so things that happen sort of anyhow, and by differences in usage of the brain regions. So for instance, 
Teenagers can affect their brain's processing ability by what they actually learn and practice. Neural connections um, that are used remain, but those that aren't used, uh, they're lost. And so you have very much a use it or lose it principle uh, with neural connections. Also, the frontal lobe of the brain um, is still immature in adolescence, and the immaturity of the frontal lobe can explain uh, why teens sometimes exhibit poor judgment and engage in risky behaviors. And that doesn't really finish until the early 20s. Okay, just about health in general. Uh, a recent study found that 18% um, of American adolescents have at least one health problem. So one very common one is just sleep deprivation. So uh, what we got here is, you know, Adolescents actually need a fair amount of sleep, um, anywhere between eight and a half, nine and a quarter hours of sleep per night. I mean, but really, nine should be the goal. Um, but a lot of you know uh, teens, adolescents are you know heavily scheduled and can't get enough sleep. So sleep deprivation is common, even though they need eight and a half, nine hours. Um, many average less than seven hours of sleep per night, and lack of sleep can cause a lot of problems. It can cause you know makes it more difficult to pay attention in school, can increase the risk for car accidents, can increase irritability, risk for depression, and poor impulse control. Which actually brings us to our next topic about food. Um, now, during the adolescent growth spurt, the body is building very quickly, and so uh, adolescents need a lot of calories uh, to fuel the growth. So, for instance, girls usually need somewhere between 1,800 and 2,400 calories per day. Uh, boys during their growth spurt, which starts a little bit later, need usually somewhere between 2,200 and 3,200 calories per day. It's a huge amount. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of poor eating habits. So, for instance, teenagers, like we see in this picture, can depend on junk food, fast food. That can both lead to uh, obesity and diabetes. can also lead to um, really a lot of nutritional deficiencies because you don't get everything you need out of this uh, food. Also, being overweight during adolescence can lead to a lot of later health problems, which in fact can lead to premature death all on their own. In fact, one major issue, uh, which doesn't have to do with obesity, is quite the opposite. It's about eating disorders. Now, the combination of society, well, when I talk about society, it's not all elements of society, but a common social pressure is on being thin, for girls to be thin. And this has an effect on the adolescent psychology. It causes some teens to be prone to develop an eating disorder. Uh, what we have in this picture is anorexia. So anorexia nervosa is full name. You know, it, it's extremely skinny. So uh, you refuse to eat and you can lose a huge amount. And anorexia can kill you. Um, anorexia, however, is not the most common. Bulimia, whereas there is a form of binging and purging, is more common. Um, in both of these, there's this irrational fear of weight gain, there's a distorted body image, and there can be severe weight loss. Um, the eating disorders are more common in women, less common in men. Um, and the, what you see, the more anorexia can kill you. Again, about 4 or 5% of women with anorexia actually die as a result of it. Bulimia is more common and doesn't have the extreme weight loss. Uh, in fact, a person with bulimia can be overweight, but what you have is this really a dysfunctional focus on body weight, and they may be engaging in things like uh, inducing vomiting, uh, so to eat, binge, and purge, or really a, um, a frantic exercising to work off uh, any calories. But what you have more than anything here is this really obsessive thinking about the body. So, you know, what can you do about it? Well, you can have hospitalization. It can be voluntary where the person goes on their own. It can be involuntary where they get checked in because parents still have the ability to do that for their minor children. And it can be necessary for the treatment of eating disorders. Uh, for instance, a person with anorexia can actually, you know, get a feeding tube up through the nose, then down the throat to actually make sure they get enough food. Um, antidepressant medication um, can be useful in treating anorexia, it can actually provide something of an appetite boost. Um, and in people with bulimia, it can actually you know, have this paradoxical effect of being able to curb, uh, curb some of the binge eating. Also, 
Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very common form of psychotherapy, has been used effectively to help anorexic and bulimic persons, you know, really to confront their dysfunctional perfectionism and the distorted body image and find ways of negotiating through a lot of these social and interpersonal demands to get to something that's a little more healthy for their own lives. That's where we're going to stop for this section.